In the name of God, the holy and undivided Trinity. Amen. I suspect that this is one of those days where given the option, every preacher in Christendom would take a pass. <laughs> Proper 22 in year B is not an easy day to preach. We hear Jesus at his harshest, at his strictest about divorce. And I'm not sure that we know what to do with that. So I think I'm going to start at what I think is something crucial to all these lessons, especially including Jesus' exchange with the Pharisees. After that exchange, when people were bringing children to Jesus, the disciples were shooing them away. And Jesus says, no, let them come to me. Don't tell them to go away. It is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. And anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. So let's start there. What does it mean to enter the kingdom of God as a little child? I have no illusions, as you probably all know, about the innocence of children. <laughs> I know that children are just as much in need of God's grace and mercy as we are. This is about the vulnerability of children, their willingness to open themselves to a new way of being in the world, to receive without question the grace of God that is offered to all of us. So let's start there. That God's grace is the non-negotiable. God's mercy is the non-negotiable. God's love is what changes all things in this world. I think it's important for us to pay attention to how we imagine God. How do we view God in our heart of hearts, in the core of our being, in our spirits? What do we think God is like? That frankly is why I spend so much time in sermons and Christian formation settings talking about God's love and God's grace and God's mercy, because I think it is important for me to hear that over and over again. And for us as a gathered community, the body of Christ, the church, to hear over and over and over again that what we are dealing with is good news. And good news is not supposed to make you feel bad. Because <laughs> it's good news. Good news of God's grace, God's love, God's mercy. Several months ago, I read in the Christian Century an article about the book of Job. And the article was kind of inviting us to think of Job not the way we like to think of Scripture, as here's the road map. This is the way it is for all time and eternity. This is it. But inviting us to hear Job as a parody, that this work is actually telling us exactly how not to think about God. Because <laughs> what's going on here at the beginning? Satan, ha Satan, the accuser, comes to God and I says, I'll bet you five dollars that Job would curse you if. <laughs> and God takes the bet <laughs> and doubles down. And I think there's a problem with our imagining God saying, okay, let's ruin this guy's life for me to prove a point. Let's ruin this guy's life for me just to show you, Satan, that you can't despite me. <laughs> and I think it opens us up to consider what is the bottom line? What is the most important thing? 
What is it about the book of Job that troubles us? How is it that our understanding of God can shift and be altered? How is it that we're being invited to not consider an angry disciplinarian in the sky calling us out for every minor infraction or for that matter, every major infraction and bringing us wrath and fury and shame and guilt. I suspect that God knows as much as we do there is enough guilt and shame in the world already. And we don't need to contribute to it. And so I always go back to a God of love, to a God of mercy, to a God of grace. No matter what we do, no matter what we don't do, no matter how badly we miss the mark, God still loves us. God still invites us into community and into relationship. And every day invites us to question even our own most deeply held opinions and ideas about the nature of God. I just wish Jesus would say over and over and over again in the Gospels, use your imagination, especially in Mark's Gospel. I mean, I love Mark's Gospel, but it is sparse. And Mark does not treat the disciples kindly. I mean, the disciples we already have seen over and over and over miss the mark. Jesus tells them, here is what is going to happen. Here is what God's love and grace and mercy looks like. I am going to Jerusalem and I will be handed over to wicked people and I will die and I will be raised again. And Peter, acting in the role of Hasatan, the accuser, no, it must not be. Get behind me, Satan. All the disciples walking down the road after Jesus has said the same thing, all the disciples end up being called out. For what? Arguing about which one of them is the greatest. Oh. Man. <laughs> Last week, John, we saw somebody casting out demons in your name and we made him stop because he was not following us. Over and over and over again, the disciples miss the point. And I love this so much because I, and I think we, over and over and over again, miss the point. We do not imagine God's grace and God's love and God's mercy as expansive as they are and we come up with all these rules and formulas and things, and here's how you avoid going to hell, and here's how you do this, and here's how, I mean, and we, and we complicate them something that is fairly simple. If you don't receive the kingdom of God as a little child, you will never enter it. And so today, the Pharisees come to Jesus. Jesus is often Jesus' foils in the gospel. And the Pharisees come to Jesus today and says, is it permissible for a man to divorce his wife? Now let's stop right there just for a moment and pay attention closely to what that question. Is it permissible for a man to divorce his wife? <laughs> It is almost like the, out of the gate, the Pharisees are not considering a whole half of the human beings on earth. Not even concerned about, is it possible, is it permissible for a woman to divorce her husband? And Jesus says what he often does, and one of the things I love about the way Jesus teaches, what does the scripture say? What does it say in Torah? <laughs> And the Pharisees answer correctly. Moses said that we can write a certificate of divorce and divorce her. 
And then Jesus responds, it is because of your hardness of heart that he wrote this law for you. And I think that's where we bump into something that none of us are comfortable with. Our own sinfulness. Our own unwillingness to accept God's grace and God's mercy. Our own catastrophic thinking that's, oh, I've made a huge mistake and God will never love me again. I am beyond God's mercy and beyond God's grace and beyond God's love. And that may be the subtlest and most horrible blasphemy of all. Jesus came to us and said, no matter what, God loves you. Be vulnerable like these little children. Be vulnerable like these little children. Receive the kingdom of God and the spirit in which it is offered. Recognize that you are going to make mistakes. Or recognize you are going to commit sins. Recognize that you are never, ever going to be perfect until God in heaven makes you perfect. It is not about our living with integrity. It's part of the problem with Job. Job was blameless. Job was a human being. (laughs) The psalmist, I will live with integrity can't pull this off on my own. We are talking about something that is a gift. And so, here's where I acknowledge that probably everybody in this room is more liberal than Jesus on the question of divorce. And I want to say, that's okay. (laughs) We can disagree with Jesus. We can recognize in this context that we're not seeing may be the whole picture. We can probably all imagine situations where marriages were better ended than continued. Where the relationship was broken to the point that on this side of the judgment couldn't be healed. And I will never ever, as a minister of the church, a priest of the church, say to someone, nope, you need to stay married because the Bible says it. I will always say, what is going on? Can this relationship be healed? And if not, recognize that maybe it's too broken. Let's think about things that get broken. We can't always fix them. We just have to offer it to God. And recognize that God is a God of love and a God of grace and a God of mercy. And God is not ever going to smack us down. God always wants our healing and our wholeness. And God wants us to recognize that grace and that mercy and that love. When I was a rookie Episcopalian, Sorry, when Isabel and I were rookie Episcopalians, long time ago, 28 plus years ago, we got married and we did our pre-marriage counseling with Father Francis Walter. And Father Francis told us something that I had not considered, that he he was not the officiant at our, our wedding ceremony. Father Francis says, nope, it's not me. I'm here to pronounce a nuptial blessing. He said, Jeff, Isabel, you are the celebrants of this liturgy. You are the officiants of this liturgy. Because what happens, imperfect as we are as human beings and imperfect as marriages can be, when we come together at the altar, it is that exchange of vows between two people who love each other that is the liturgy that is the thing we celebrate. And we don't enter into marriage unadvisedly or lightly, to quote the prayer book. 
But we also don't enter into a lot of things unadvisedly or lightly. We don't enter into baptism unadvisedly or lightly, and we don't enter into the Holy Eucharist unadvisedly or lightly, and we don't enter into confirmation unadvisedly or lightly, or ordination or holy unction or the rite of reconciliation. We take seriously God's presence, and we recognize God's love and God's mercy and God's grace. And what we are celebrating in all these instances, however imperfectly, because we're not going to get it perfect until God in heaven makes us perfect, is exactly that. Mercy, love, grace, forgiveness, and that that's the bottom line for God. The bottom line for Jesus is in all that you do, Receive the kingdom of God as little children. Receive the kingdom of God with vulnerability. Receive the kingdom of God with humility. Receive the kingdom of God who have been set free from sin. Because grace is the final word. Grace is what makes us whole. Grace is what makes us new. Grace is what makes us in the fullness of time into the image and likeness of Christ. We don't pull it off on our own. We don't pretend that it is about our integrity. We don't pretend that it is about our ability to do this. I've got it. Check it out. I am so strong. We recognize that we are vulnerable and that we are in need of God's grace and God's mercy and above all, God's love. Amen.